Good evening. Glad all of you are here. Let's all stand up real quick. In the beginning, God made the seas and the forest filled with trees and the mountains up so high. At the top, he placed the sky. His fingerprints are everywhere just to show how much he cares. In the middle, he had some fun. He made a hip that weighs a ton. Hip, 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 hippopotamus. Hip, hip, hooray, God made all of us. Hip, 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 hippopotamus. Hip, hip, hooray, God made all of us. Big, deep breath. Okay, you ready? In the beginning, I made the seas and the forest filled with trees and the mountains up so high. At the top, he placed the skies. Fingerprints are everywhere. Just to show how much he cares. In the middle, he had some fun. He made a hip of the woods a ton. Hip, 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 bottom us. Hip, hip, break, I made all of us. Hip, 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 bottom us. Hip, hip, break, I made all of us. All right, y'all can have a seat. If you did not remember, tonight we are swapping things up a little bit, changing things. To some extent, it's like a hybrid model, I guess, between what the way things used to be, where we went straight to class and then came back here at the end. And what we've been doing over the last several years where we meet in here and then go to class and dismiss from class. What we are doing tonight is here in just a few minutes after I ask a few questions on on my book of the Bible. That'll be one of the questions is which one. Heads up on that. We will head straight to class. The bells will ring at 740 and 745. At that 745 bell, we will reconvene here in the auditorium at which point in time we will have our announcements we'll have a quick invitation and a song and then we will have a closing prayer after that so 740 and 745 for the bells we will come back in here after that 745 bell any questions good all right we're all on the same page So last week we asked a few questions over the first book of the Bible. Remember, we're going to kind of go through that. How many weeks in a year again? How many? 52. Thank you, Lance. 52. And then if we have 52 Wednesdays, we have more books of the Bible than that. So at some point in time, we're going to have to double up a little bit. But if we, if this is the second Wednesday of the year, then what book of the Bible might you think we're going to have some questions on tonight? Anybody, all right, Exodus. First question. It was also a question last week. Who wrote the book of Exodus? Moses. All right. There are a couple of big tens in the book of Exodus. A couple of big tens. Who can tell me what both of those are? All right, Kingston. Plagues and. Huh? Plagues and commandments. Plagues and commandments. Now, it's interesting because right out of the gates in the book of Exodus, we find that the Israelites are being oppressed by the Egyptians. But we find that the more that Egypt oppressed the Egyptians, what happened to the Israelites? This is the hardest question, probably. What happened to the Israelites the more they were oppressed by Egypt? Keegan, you know it? No, that's what they, they cut. Yeah. All right. Huh? I can't hear you, but I don't think that's right. Huh? The more they were saved, well, God did save them, but there's something else. The more that they were oppressed, something happened to them and their number. Yes, Bailey. They grew. The more they multiplied, the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. And when God is on our side, we can expect that he will continue to bless us no matter what is up against us. At this time, you are dismissed to your classes.
Good evening. Joe is on point. He's here. <laughs> well, you didn't expect to have to put up with me again, though, did you? All righty. Let me get all situated here. Um, we, we did get our, our lot of workbooks in finally, and um, uh, as I told you last week, the, uh, uh, the author of this particular study is Drew Kaiser. His brother Bart was uh, uh, with us several years ago as a youth intern. Um, his dad is Andy. Uh, Andy now resides in Florence, and, and they have a, a publishing company. They've written, all three of them have written some books. Uh, this one uh, particularly is by uh, Drew. And, um, you know, the goal of this book is just to uh, help us uh, uh, take a better look, see the cross through the eyes of the people that were there. So we looked last week at the, uh, at the prophets, um, and uh, they, uh, they saw it uh, pristinely, didn't miss a detail. Um, interpretations and expectations were somewhat convoluted by, uh, by people, but uh, uh, that, that's not their fault. Uh, we want to continue looking tonight, and uh, Lord willing, you'll, you'll get a little more variety. I'm going to try to catch up with you to another lesson on in uh, February. But uh, here are the different uh, individuals we'll be focusing on as we try to look to uh, the cross and some of the events occurring there. Uh, Judas Iscariot is our topic tonight. Judas Iscariot. It's not a feel-good story, is it? Um, it makes one wonder, how could somebody be in proximity to... God in the flesh for three and a half years and perpetrate the crime that he perpetrated. It, uh, it at times boggles imagination. But there are just some hints in Scripture that, uh, that kind of give us a cautionary tale um, that, uh, that make us better understand some of the warnings of Scripture as to why uh, we ought to uh, uh, we ought to take heed about certain things. Um, it's strange in recent years, perhaps some of you have uh, heard and caught wind of this, but uh, some people have uh, counted uh, the reaction of Judas so implausible that uh, they, they said, well, he was just doing it to try to get Jesus, to try to force Jesus' hand, uh, to try to make... Uh, uh, Jesus uh, uses power to become that political leader that really blinded the Jewish leaders that we talked about last week when we looked at the prophets. And so they try to put a spin on it that way, that uh, uh, his plan failed, and when it failed, he committed suicide. Uh, there is, in fact, a... a, a long lost Gnostic document. The Gnostics were the knowers and they presented a, 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 a heretical group in the second and third centuries and influenced uh, further yet. Um, and uh, they called uh, Jesus, the, uh, the Judas, the only true disciple that he and Jesus were in cahoots on this, uh, on this uh, thing and um, uh, it was just a, a plot by the two of them. Um, so it really gets outlandish because the story unfolds and it happens the way it happens and it said plainly what was uh, happening. And uh, there are really just, uh, you know, just two points that we need to, uh, that we need to understand about uh, Judas. Number one, he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was one of the twelve. He was one of those that Jesus uh, prayed the night uh, before in Luke chapter 6 verses 12 through uh, 16 uh, and then he chose 
from those disciples. He would have been a disciple before he was asked to serve as an apostle. And so uh, he had whatever talents, he had whatever potential, he had opportunity to be all that any of the other apostles were. But sin got a hold of him. It took root in him. And we need to look at that. And we need to beware because the same thing can happen to you and I. The other fact about Judas that we need to be clear on is that he did betray our Lord Jesus Christ. He betrayed the Messiah, the anointed one, the long looked for one. And he did so with a kiss. It makes Paul's warning years later to those who are at uh, Corinth very uh, appropriate for our reflection tonight. Um, therefore, if anybody thinks he stands, let him take heed lest he falls. Um, none of us is immune from uh, temptation and giving in to temptation. And so for that reason, uh, Judas is a story that needs to be told. Not every story needs to be a feel-good story. We need to understand the outcome of some of the more unfortunate personalities and stories contained in Scripture. I like the way that uh, Brother Drew uh, strives to show this spiral. Um, now, he, I looked at the terms he used and I couldn't come up with anything better. And we want to follow Judas's spiral uh, as, as Scripture leads us. And um, the first uh, statement is conjecture, yes, but uh, a very real possibility and something that you and I need to heed. And uh, the statement is made, Judas's journey started with contempt, with contempt contempt um, sin starts small but it often ends big the Old Testament uh, says uh, we sow to the wind we reap the whirlwind sin is always worse than we think that it ever will be it just always is and uh, and we could take time to uh, look back at uh, uh, Eve, um, you know, sin starts with a thought, with an idea, with a longing, a desire, a lust, if you will. She saw the fruit. She desired the fruit. She believed the whisper of the, the serpent. And uh, she ate it, took it and ate it, and gave it to her husband, and he did eat um, you think of Joseph's brothers, little jealous, obnoxious brat, led them to, some of them to think even of murder, but they all agreed to uh, uh, sell him into slavery, their own brother. There was uh, Achan. You remember Achan? I saw, I coveted, I took, and I hid it. And he died and all of his family with him because of his sin. And yes, David, not on the battlefield while his men were fighting, up on a rooftop. It was customary for ladies to, uh, to bathe on the rooftop. He wasn't where he should have been. And he gazed too long at something he shouldn't have seen. And lust ended up in adultery and murder. Sin always extracts a greater toll than we think it should or would or will. 
<clears throat> this is the conjecture part. We just have to piece together from what little we know. But um, we often uh, hear Judas, the name Judas Iscariot. Iscariot. That's actually a, um, uh, a Greek name that means man from Kuroth. Kuroth happens to be a suburb, an outlying area from Jerusalem. So his family was from Jerusalem, the holy city, the city where God allowed his name to be written. You know from hints in the New Testament that some in Jerusalem looked down upon those who lived further north in Galilee, in Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Oh, those Galileans, you can tell them by their language. How many of you think you could tell somebody that was from the state of Louisiana? What's uh, the reputation that uh, we Southerners have uh, uh, from our uh, brothers and sisters in the North? So the roles kind of reversed. Uh, up North is the country bumpkins and uh, the elites are in the area of Jerusalem. Who knows how much that may have been a part. As far as we can tell, all the other apostles were Galileans or at least from the North. And uh, one wonders how much this might have uh, played a role in, uh, in some of uh, Judas' uh, uh, perceptions. And perhaps he held, uh, held them in uh, a little bit of contempt. Perhaps he, you know, he wasn't part of the inner circle, was he? Peter, James, and John had had those special relationships, special encounters with Jesus. But he didn't view himself as less. He probably viewed himself as a cut above all those other fellows that he served with. We get another insight into uh, Judas, the person. Um, and we see him be quite critical at a uh, supper in honor of the Lord that was held in Bethany just a couple miles outside of Jerusalem um, at the home of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Let's uh, read what John has to say about this particular encounter, beginning in verse 3. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, and then John adds parenthetically, he who was about to betray him said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this, John informs us, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. John was kind of blunt there, wasn't he? And having charge of the money bag, he was kind of the treasurer for the apostles, and he liked to pilfer. He used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you have with you always, but you do not always have me. Judas, very vocal, very prominent, and um, he actually is a perfect example of a criticizer, a criticizer. Uh, let's camp out just a moment here and think about how, uh, how criticizers are, because you and I know we can lapse into that sin really easily, can't we? Uh, someone, uh, I think it was George Bailey, uh, uh, he said it doesn't take much size to criticize. And he's correct. Um, 
this pound of nard, this special ointment, uh, 300 denarii, that, that was about an average laborer's year's worth of work. That was the income that an average laborer could make. So it was a costly uh, gift that uh, Mary was using here. Um, but uh, Judas, we learned, was a hypocrite. He didn't really care about the poor. He would really liked to have his hands on the money he could make off of what was being doled out there on Jesus. And uh, criticizers often present themselves as being sympathetic toward individuals who only want what is best for uh, the Lord's kingdom. Uh, I'm just doing this for the cause of the Lord. Um, and often they're just governed by selfish motives. Criticizers are a little out of focus. A little out of focus. They uh, major in the minors. Um, they, uh, they don't really see the, the clear picture that they, uh, they need to. Um, it's interesting that uh, as Judas was so outdone that, that Mary would waste this amount on the feet of Jesus. And in Mark 14, uh, 3 through 9, Mark, uh, he uses that word, uh, the, Mary's act. He calls it wasteful. It was wasteful. So uh, critics often uh, dwell on peripheral issues. Um, they, uh, they get all in a knot about concerns that uh, draw our focus away from uh, the goals of glorifying the Lord and saving lost souls. And, uh, you know, if you think about it, there's nothing that slows down the work of the, uh, the Lord's growth the Lord's people and the growth of the church than critics because that tends to be an internal thing. Uh, there can be outside critics, but that's a different thing when we have internal critics. It just bogs down the effectiveness of the local work. Now, you let outside forces assault the church. What happened in the first century? The church grew. Outside forces the church grows, but criticism uh, is like poison, uh, and uh, and we all need to, to be careful. Uh, so, uh, Mark and Matthew, they talk about uh, Mary's sacrifice as a waste, uh, uh, Matthew 26, verse 8. This same Greek word is rendered destruction. And it's the word that Jesus uses in his description of Judas in John chapter 17, verse 12. So little did Judas know that he was really the waste in that whole incident and scenario there. Criticizers usually don't get involved in the ongoing work of a local uh, congregation or a local event or whatever the effort might be. Uh, they enjoy uh, pontificating over uh, the weaknesses or the wrongdoings or the failures or whatever. And, uh, you know, there was no perfume on the hands of Judas. Uh, Mary was anointing the, the, the feet of Jesus. Uh, Martha was busy serving uh, you have uh, uh, Lazarus and Simon who are uh, playing host to this uh, large gathering. But not Judas. It's easy to become critical when you don't play a role, when you don't have a role, when you don't take a role. And so I think the lesson here for you and me is uh, uh, be sure we're, uh, we're finding our place uh, uh, attaching ourselves to people who are busy, who are active. Uh, you may not have a have a thing that uh, that you can see right away that uh, uh, that you think you would serve well at, but uh, get with somebody that uh, that is busy, and 
and your place will manifest and be ready to take that up. And uh, getting busy in the Lord's work is the best, uh, best antidote to this attitude of uh, hypercriticalness that we see exhibited here by Judas. And then quite bluntly, cri criticizers are thieves. They're thieves. Now, uh, Judas, of course, was a, a literal thief. Um, all criticizers are thieves, uh, although not all of them steal money. Uh, critics, uh, they, they steal time. Um, they uh, tie up personnel. They rob you of happiness and fulfillment in the work that you're doing. Uh, they uh, uh, degrade accomplishments. And uh, they're thieves of many things. John places this story, this account, uh, chronologically as it happens. It's interesting that Matthew and Mark, when they cover this incident, uh, they put it right before the the betrayal of, uh, of the Lord. And uh, evidently they felt that would uh, help explain how a man that had been an apostle could do a dastardly deed like betray him. And so uh, criticism, the spiral of sin, the snowballing effect that sin has, uh, criticism, would lead to the treachery that we remember Judas for. Last week we noted how Psalm chapter 41 verse 9 said that he would be the Messiah, would be handed over by a close friend, a close comrade, which Judas would have been. Um, after feeding the 5,000, Jesus began to... Uh, to deliver some, some hard scenes, some difficult scenes. And in John uh, chapter 6, verse 64, it reads, But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Just a few verses later in verse 70, he says, did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. A devil. Jesus had all, or Judas had already allowed uh, sin to kind of be a part of his life. Uh, his heart was cracked. And it was easy for Satan just to ease right in. And, and to, to, to kind of hold this... Uh, possibility of turning over the Lord. It seemed evidently pretty clear to him. It seemed uh, like the right thing to do at the time that he did it. Let's look at Luke as he follows uh, the story in chapter 22. We'll begin at verse 3. Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who was one of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Well, he didn't want the people around, did he? How smoothly the sin of greed pilfering from the money pouch, the treasury of the apostles, morphs into this most heinous crime. Indeed, when Paul warned Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, about the love of money, he said it's a, it's a taproot that leads to all other kinds of evil and wickedness. And it certainly proved the case in the life of Judas, and it has many since him. You know, that last little phrase lets us know that uh, Judas was actually a coward, was he not? He didn't want 
the scrutiny of the masses knowing what he was doing. But he wanted to get Jesus in a circumstance where he was away from the crowds and turn him over in absence of the crowd. Let's think about that Thursday evening when the disciples were gathered together for that last meal that we know of as the Lord's Supper. You remember that Jesus had uh, washed the feet of the disciples. Put yourself in each of those people's place. Oh, we know how some felt. Peter, oh, wash. If that's the way it is, Lord, just give me a bath. Jesus had to wash Judas' feet, knowing full well what Judas was going to do. Judas, Satan had already entered in his heart, put this idea, and he accepted it. And he was determined to find a time and a place that was right. And he was committed to that. And he knew what he was going to do, and there he has to sit and let the Savior wash his feet. After Jesus finished washing their feet, he made this statement in John 13, verse 11. He said, not all of you are clean. That kind of set them to, to talking amongst themselves. Even though they were around the table where, of course, they were kind of laying on their side, reclined on the one elbow and John of course was laying such that he was right next to Jesus and um, Peter gets John's attention uh, as he was ex speaking to Jesus and um, and he wants to know who is it who is it that's not clean and certainly they all must have been asking. And John asked Jesus, he says, what's, what's the signal, Lord? What, who, who is it? Jesus says, the person that I dipped this bread in the, the sop, the old King James rendering, um, this morsel of bread, he dipped and he hands it to Judas. At some point in the midst of all this, Judas asks, is it I, Rabbi? I'm sure he's just wanting to fit in that he's hearing everybody else ask this. And Jesus replies to him in Matthew 26, verse 25, you have said so. And he follows that with what you must do, do quickly. And he gets up and he leaves. It's after Judas left that Jesus then institutes the Lord's Supper. I think it's important for us to keep that reference in mind that uh, Judas did not share in this special communion of the Lord. Not that night, nor any other. Judas was the one who chose the sign of the kiss to be the signal to those guards who weren't familiar with Jesus, didn't know him by face. A kiss, the sign of love and friendship. And Judas transformed it forever into a mark of betrayal. 
And with that, the armed guard took Jesus and led him to the events surrounding his crucifixion. From treachery, sin leads us to surrender. Surrender of sorts. I want to read from the New American Standard Bible, Matthew uh, 27, verses 3 through 5. Then when Judas, who had been betrayed, or who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. That is significant, to betray innocent blood. Read Exodus 23, 7. But they said, what is that to us? See to that yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the sanctuary and departed, and he went away and hanged himself. There are two words in the New Testament uh, translated uh, repent. Repent. The first word is, uh, I'll, not, I'll not try to uh, slaughter it by pronouncing that first Greek word there. You can see meta, you know, that's, uh, that's the, the change part, uh, metamorphosis. Um, but that means to know after. That's the kind of repentance in the word used in Acts 2.38. Godly sorrow. That leads to a change of heart. That leads to a change in direction of your conduct. That's the kind of repentance that um, um, Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Um, a godly sorrow. I have sinned against God Almighty. And it's to Him I need to, I need to quit what I'm doing and change and humbly uh, make my direction back toward Him. Romans 2, 4. Um, There's a second word there at the bottom. It means to care after. And that's the word used here. Some translations remember, uh, will render uh, that, uh, that Judas repented. Well, he didn't have godly sorrow that changed his heart. But he did have remorse over what he had done. He did feel badly about what he had done but he didn't want to change his direction. And he had such a sense of dread over the consequences of his action that he went out and hanged himself. That's not the kind of repentance that you and I want to manifest. That's not the kind of repentance that God desires of sinners He quit. Judas just plain quit. And the reason he quit, I think, would be because he lost hope. He lost hope. He didn't see any way out. <coughs> Instead of running toward God in repentance, he just threw up the flag and says, I quit. And now the question comes, would God have forgiven Jesus if he'd responded to him? And I have to believe that he would have. He forgave Peter. Peter denied him. He forgives sins that we confess and re we repent of when we have godly sorrow, not just because I'm caught with my hand in the cookie jar, not just because I've sinned and I've made a mess of my life and woe is me. 
but I have shamed the God of heaven and earth. And I'm going to do something different about it. I'm going to, I'm going to approach him the way he wants to be approached. I think he lost hope. People uh, quit jobs because they lose hope in their ability to better themselves, climb the ladder, be recognized and promoted. People quit marriages because they believe there's no hope for peace and companionship. They quit friendships when they think there's no hope for reconciliation. And they'll quit churches because they think there's no hope for inclusion, for true worship, sound doctrine, for spiritual service. When people think there's no hope for redemption, they will quit God. And yet He will not fail us. We talked in our Hebrew study last quarter about... Hebrews 13, verses 5 through 6. Hope, an anchor for the soul. We have a high priest who can be approached. And hope keeps us keeping on. Hope keeps us from quitting. The disciples' uh, epithet to this sorry section of the life of Judas was that in Acts one twenty five. He went to his own place. He went to his own place. He received the penalty he deserved for the crimes against Christ. And his place is one of eternal condemnation. His name forever attached to the greatest atrocity, I guess, in human history. And you and I need to remember that his journey started back with just little things. Little grudges. Little uh, predispositions. And it grew. It opened the door to his heart. Changes seemed small at first. And it snowballed into this uncontrolled avalanche that he recognized at the end was wrong and then didn't respond, didn't feel like he could respond appropriately. Every transgression can be the one that leads us down a path where we forget God's way. So we need to examine ourselves. We need to uh, take seriously when our brothers and sisters uh, uh, in firm kindness tell us, hey, you need to reevaluate what you're doing here. And uh, we need to help our story end the way the Lord wants it to. Would you bow with me? Kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for this period of uh, study and meditation upon your word we again thank you for sending your son to the cross in our stead we pray father that we would uh, learn uh, not only the path that he showed us how to walk but that we would learn how to avoid the pitfalls of those who failed your people and you. And we pray, Father, that we can uh, motivate one another to walk in the pathway that is right, to be profitable servants in your kingdom. Thank you for being a gracious God. Help us to walk in the straight and the narrow. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Well, as you are finding your seats, I'm going to go ahead and start with our announcements for this evening. Uh, we've got several prayer requests to pass along to you. Jerry Harris is scheduled for gallbladder surgery this Friday at Murray Regional Hospital. Dean Hughes is gradually recovering at home from a case of the flu. Uh, Kaylee Pope Lindsay is now scheduled to have gallbladder surgery on Thursday, January 25th, unless there is an opening in the surgery schedule prior to that date. Neil Fain, a former member here, had a heart stent placement procedures yesterday at Murray Regional. Uh, during the night, his AFib returned, and after treatment for AFib, Neil was released today to go home. Sam Slater, who is a friend of many here at Pulaski Street and is also a member at the Gandhi Church of Christ, had surgery on Monday uh, to remove a portion of his colon. Sam came through the surgery well and was up walking the halls yesterday. He is, at this point, awaiting some pathology results. Rachel Workman, this is the granddaughter of C.W. and Judy Vandiver. Uh, she has been battling Guillain-Barr syndrome uh, for more than a year. Uh, Rachel is now able to walk some with and without a walker, so she is becoming uh, more uh, mobile, which is a great sign, which we hope continues to go in that direction, and we're asked to continue praying for her. She gradually improves. I'll mention to you James Weeks. I uh, went to visit him this afternoon in Mount Pleasant, uh, his condition is low. They have brought in a hospital bed into his bedroom, and prayers for him are coveted at this time. We want to extend uh, Christian love and sympathy to the family of Viva Jean Kilburn. Uh, Viva Jean was the sister of T.J. Hughes. She was the aunt of Shane Hughes and Kaylee Donnelly. She was the great aunt of Kim Tennant Brown and Carter Hughes. The visitation will be Thursday, January the 11th, from, that's tomorrow night, from 5 until 8. And then the funeral will be held on Friday at 1 o'clock p.m. at Pettis Turnbow Funeral Home. We also want to extend our Christian love and sympathy to the family of Bill Sisk. Bill, as many of you know, was the husband of Barbara Sisk. He was the father of Steve Sisk. He was the grandfather of Zoe Davis, and the arrangements will be made at Neil Funeral Home uh, tomorrow around lunchtime. A few reminders here, Evangelism University will be held this weekend, January 12th through the 14th in Savannah, Tennessee. Uh, please keep our group in your prayers as they travel and participate in EU. We will be meeting at 5.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Building this Sunday for Feast. And then we might also mention, in case you didn't know, there will be no school uh, this coming Monday, January 15th, due to Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. Uh, I had a feeling even if it wasn't Martin Luther King James holiday, uh, or <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, that we wouldn't be having school anyway because of the weather. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so, I, right now, I just heard this when I was coming from Mount Pleasant. There is an announcement that was made a little after 5 o'clock Eastern, 4 o'clock our time, that almost broke the Internet, and that is that Nick Saban is uh, retiring from college football. I have, I have Sirius XM. I, that was sort of uh, bequeathed to me uh, through da Dad had that service on his truck, and so I'm enjoying that. It's probably got nine sports stations right there in a row. If you have Sirius XM, it starts about number 80, goes through like 89 or something. So what do you think was on every channel when you went through that list? Every channel was talking about this announcement that came out of Tuscaloosa today. Then you get on Facebook, right? And you look through Facebook, and I am not kidding. Every other, sometimes back to back to back to back to back, it was somebody from their Facebook page announcing something that 20 other people had already announced on their, on their Facebook page, right? 
And then you can also imagine that the responses to, to the news, on one hand, you had abject grief, right? Folks just, I mean, talk about a hole, you know, that it, it, was, it was terrible news. And then on the other hand, you had people that were rejoicing. I mean, just could not be happier at the news. I've seen it today, you know. You talk with people. They're just, it's kind of one of those polarizing things. But one of the things I reflected on, well, one of the things I thought about is like, you know, one day when I retire some sometime in the future, one thing that's not going to happen is it's not going to, it's not going to be on all the news channels, right? Uh, and that's probably true. Some of you that already retired, I mean, it was a big deal in your workplace. They're going to miss you. But it doesn't get that kind of, I'm, I'm telling you, this thing, this news today is going to dominate across all kinds of lines over the next week and a half or two or more, you know. And then I thought, well, you know, that's something that's happened here on earth, you know. But is there anything, is there any indication in Scripture of something that just gets real famous in heaven? Something that just has this, what might I dare say, global effect on heaven. Well, in fact, there is. I go to Luke 15, read the first two parables there. And one is about a lost coin. One is about a lost sheep. And in both cases, whenever the lost sheep was found or the lost coin was found, in that sort of immediate household or whatever, there was some rejoicing, but there's two sort of taglines to those two stories that are very interesting. Verse 7, right at the end of the lost sheep story, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. And then, the very next parable, Verse 10, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, my connection here is not just as folks rejoice at the retiring of Nick Saban, so folks are rejoicing in heaven over, you know, the, the sinner repents. I'm just talking about the profound systemic effect that the news has. There's a retirement that happened today that honestly is just pretty blown their minds. They're like, wow, what the end of an era, you know? But when a sinner repents, I just I'm not sure what kind of I'm not sure what kind of reception a retirement got in heaven, but I do know what kind of reception a repentance gets in heaven. And so if per chance this evening you're in need of such a repentance just know that not only uh, will we be certainly elated for you heaven itself erupts in praise and joy this evening perhaps we can accommodate you in some way and if that's true come now we're together we stand and sing There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us haste, oh haste, to its brink. Tis the fount of love from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain opened for all. There's a living stream with a crystal gleam. From the throne of life now it flows. 
while the waters roll. Let the weary soul hear the call that forth freely goes. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. There's a rock that's cleft, and no soul is left that may not its pure water share. Tis for you and me, and its stream I see. Let us hasten joyfully there. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain opened for all. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We are grateful for this time that we've had to come together in a warm building and to be able to study your word and to consider ways that we can grow. We ask that you would be with us as we leave tonight and help us to be lights in this community, wherever we may be over the coming days, and keep us safe. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.